On Guido Talks this week, the Salmon Sturgeon Civil War reaches boiling point, the Union unit in number 10 closes down for good, and Sadiq Khan's statue guru is fired over racism. All that and more coming up on this week's show. Stick about. Hello and welcome to Guido Talks, the show where we go over the last week of news on the Guido Fawkes website. My name's Tom Harwood and once again I'm joined by Guido Fawkes founder and editor Paul Staines and reporter Christian Calgi. Now, this week was a heavy week. Parliament was back but it wasn't in Westminster where we saw the biggest news break. Early this week we saw Alex Salmond release his bombshell evidence to the Salmond inquiry up in Holyrood. Now, the easy way to go through this, because it's a complicated set of procedures, and I do encourage you to look at the easy explanation that we put up on the Guido Fawkes website if you have time. We've bullet pointed some of the main accusations that Alex Salmond makes, but the nub of the issue is that Nicola Sturgeon appears to have lied to Parliament over when she knew of Alex Salmon's uh, sexual assault complaints, of the complaints against him. And the reason why this turned from a legitimately large story into a bigger story about the very um, proper nature of government in Scotland is because some of the most contentious claims from Alex Salmon's evidence were expunged from that evidence, were censored by the Crown, an organisation that seems to be in hock to Nicola Sturgeon north of the border. Now, the claim that was most contentiously taken out of his evidence against his will, that now cannot be discussed in the inquiry, is that Nicola Sturgeon lied to Parliament and therefore broke the standing orders, an offence that the standing orders say is a resignation issue. Now, Liam Fox brought this up most eloquently in the House of Commons on Wednesday. Let's have a listen. Point of order, Dr Liam Fox. Madam Deputy Speaker, yesterday the former First Minister of Scotland, Alex Salmond, accused the Scottish Government of, and I quote, the complete breakdown of the necessary barriers which should exist between government, political party and indeed the prosecution authorities in any country which abides by the rule of law. Madam Deputy Speaker, this would be a damning indictment in a tin pot dictatorship, but this is happening in a part of the United Kingdom. Given that the Scottish Parliament derives its authority from legislation passed in this Parliament, what mechanisms do we have to ensure that the conduct of the Scottish Government does not bring politics in the whole of the United Kingdom into international disrepute? I'm grateful to the Right Honourable Member for having given notice that he intended to raise this point of order. He has raised some very significant issues concerning the relationship between the legislature, the executive and the courts. That is the doctrine known as the separation of powers, which is a very bedrock of our constitutional settlement. Uh, it is not, of course, for the occupant of the chair uh, to make any judgment uh, about what the Right Honourable Gentleman has specifically said, or indeed the quotation uh, which he used. But this House is, of course, always concerned with safeguarding democratic standards. And I'm sure that the Right Honourable Gentleman will use his ingenuity uh, to find a way of bringing this matter once again before the House when it can be fully examined. So, Tom, you've been following this closely. Where does it go? Well, the big question now, and this is a, an awkward question for us, because, of course, we're recording this podcast on Thursday, and Alex Salmond has said that he'll be appearing before the inquiry on Friday, the day this podcast goes out. However, earlier he did say he'd be appearing before the inquiry on Wednesday and pulled out after this censorship came about of his evidence because, it, of course, it, can't, it means that he can't be asked a question on one of the most fundamental points of his, his evidence, the point of the First Minister uh, allegedly lying to Parliament. That very heavy accusation now can't be considered by the inquiry, which means that his, uh, his appearance before that inquiry will be a lot less explosive than it potentially could be. On this very point, Ruth Davidson brought up 
the issue and the stuff that's been censored in Parliament. Look at this. Here's why all the redacted parts of Alex Hammond's evidence are important, because they're exactly the parts that expose the First Minister. On the BBC Twice, she claimed to know, not to know of anything about sexual misconduct claims before April 2018. Three separate times she told Parliament that she found out from Alex Salmond himself that month. But she's been desperate to shut down everything about the secret meeting in her office the month before because it wrecks her whole argument and confirms that she misled Parliament. The truth is, she knew about those allegations before April 2018. And worse, we know now that she discussed sexual harassment complaints against Alex Salmond with her chief executive, with her chief civil servant and with her chief of staff in November, four months earlier. Does the First Minister understand why the public, to the public, this looks like a cover-up? And the most striking point about this is that Nicola Sturgeon replied by saying, well, it wasn't censored because you said it now. But the point isn't whether it's said or known in any chamber or in any field. The point is if it's admissible to the inquiry. And it being expunged from the evidence means that the inquiry can't discuss it. So it's out of realm for the inquiry. So Nicola Sturgeon is sitting happy, absolutely aloof of any accusations against her or of the most important accusation against her. That's the fundamental point. And what Liam Fox was saying in the clip two clips ago was that this absolutely undermines the very separation of powers, the constitutional integrity of devolved government. You can't have the executive interfering in uh, judicial proceedings like this, and yet this would appear to be what has happened in this case. What I think he's saying is the fix is in, and if the fix stays in, she'll survive at the expense of parliamentary um, uh, governance. And what was really disappointing was that it took um, a point of order from Liam Fox to bring this up in Parliament, in, in, in Westminster. Of course, lots of people are talking about this in the Scottish Parliament, but Boris didn't bring this up in Prime Minister's questions at all, not even in response to Angus Robertson's um, usual dull questions in Prime Minister's questions. Um, the idea that Boris is sort of taking a back seat here, I think, is a bit worrying um, and, and lends to a sort of um, messy union strategy from number 10. But isn't this a byproduct of the fact that on Friday, the uh, head of the union unit, uh, Oliver Lewis Sonic, resigned? That's right. This is the next story that I think Cowie can tell us a bit more about. Yes, yeah, so we've had some uh, further backroom chaos in uh, number 10, uh, specifically to do with the so-called union unit, which was supposed to be a, a top level of uh, spads who were going to be focused on uh, keeping the UK together. And as Paul said, on Friday afternoon, we had the news that the latest uh, incumbent head, uh, Oliver Lewis, who was really one of the remaining uh, of the uh, uh, Cummings faction, uh, was uh, heading out the door. And there was uh, all sorts of uh, briefing from every camp imaginable. There were accusations he'd uh, leaked against Michael Gove. There were accusations that once again Carrie Simmons uh, is getting involved and uh, we uh, uh, editorialised her as the, the, the godmother on, on Monday morning. Um, and this uh, eventually led to, uh, on Thursday evening, us breaking the news that the union unit uh, is not going to get a third head in recent weeks. In fact, it's essentially being shut down and it's moving from a, a SPAD-based advisor operation into a cabinet subcommittee consisting of the PM, Gove, Rishi, uh, the Northern Ireland Scottish and Welsh Secretaries and Sir David Frost. That being said, Henry Newman, who is of course a SPAD, he used to work for Michael Gove, he's just moved across to number 10 and he's seen as being a bit of an ally of Carrie Simmons, will be the SPAD that sort of um, takes the helm of this cabinet subcommittee. And one of the questions that seems to be raised at the moment is that what needs to be built underneath this committee for it to have any um, 
for, for it to have any use really beyond just setting a line is the infrastructure, is the, the hierarchies through the civil service, the ability to get stuff done. That existed under those Brexit committees that this cabinet subcommittee is, is going to be based on. Um, and it's one of the things that Oliver Lewis was trying to do in his two short weeks in the previous incarnation of the union unit. So um, the, the, there'll be a lot of work on Henry Newman's shoulders to try and set up all of those um, organisational and frankly more boring elements in order to make this strategy work. Because it's all very good, uh, well and good, a cabinet minister deciding on a line, but unless that can be implemented through the structures of the civil service below, that doesn't mean very much at all. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> let's turn our attention towards an increasingly regular feature, which is uh, that of Sadiq Khan's relationship with London's statues and heritage. Uh, this week, uh, there were two main uh, aspects to this uh, ongoing narrative. Firstly, Sakia uh, took a, a surprisingly radical position on, on his LBC uh, phone-in show. Uh, and uh, uh, said that uh, essentially statues can and maybe must fall. Let's watch that. I haven't spoken to um, Sadiq about it, John, but um, I think each community, whether it's London or anywhere else, is entitled to have a conversation about what it wants in terms of statues and street names, etc. Um, and it needs to be decided, I don't know, city by city, region by region. So, but I haven't actually spoken to um, Sadiq about it. You would support then, in some instances, statues being taken down or st street names being changed? I think communities are entitled to express a view on what statues they want up in their area. Um, so I wouldn't... I'm not sure I see it as a priority in terms of what we're living through and what we've got in terms of getting the country back up and running. Right. Um, but... Um, if I was living in a community, I probably would like to express a view one way or the other, and I think that's not a bad thing. But, right. The um, suggestions are that the, the panel that um, Sadiq Khan has put together is rather narrow, narrow, perhaps. It needs broader representation. I, that, I, look, I, I haven't looked at the panel, to be perfectly honest. Um, I will now go and do have so, right. but I'll have a look at it. OK, we'll talk perhaps next time you return. And this uh, phone-in preceded a, a rather dramatic turn of events, which was the uh, fairly well-known... Uh, chapel on Guido, Toyin Agbetu, one of Sadiq's 15 statue commissars, was sacked uh, this week for a, a sort of anti-Semitic blog post that had been uncovered by Jewish news. And of course, uh, Toyin is, is the very same uh, chap that we uh, revealed to have once uh, interrupted a, a ceremony involving the Queen and broke through security and was uh, yelling quite derangedly at her. Imagine my surprise when we discovered that a left-wing, anti-monarchist, anti-racist has a problem with Israel. Shocking. But the interesting thing here is how Sadiq Khan's position has changed since the summer. In the summer, he was busy telling anyone who'll listen that any statue with any link to slavery whatsoever must be torn down and hurriedly announced this wacky left-wing committee to go and tear down statues. But now that the sort of uh, the red mist has, has uh, lifted and that there's less immediate pressure and an election coming up in London, Sadiq Khan has for the last couple of weeks been at pains to say he doesn't now want to take down statues and that all this committee is going to be doing is proposing new statues to uh, be put up. That's very interesting considering the people he's put on the committee probably decided earlier before we were so close to an election because a lot of them have spoken of the joy of tearing down statues as readers may remember from a couple of weeks ago on the Guido Fawkes website. But obviously Keir Starmer has not got the memo because as Sadiq Khan has been embarrassingly rowing back from his tear down the statues position, Keir Starmer has been merrily blundering into that position once again, saying that actually statues should be removed in certain communities, just as Sadiq Khan's saying the opposite. There, I mean, we talk a lot about the sort of mixed messaging and confusion in number 10. It seems that the, the, the mixed messaging within the Labour Party is, is rivaling that. And the thing, the thing I find particularly impressive is that 
uh, Keir Starmer uh, doesn't even know his own message because, of course, it was on his uh, LBC phone-in programme about two months ago that he was roundly attacked uh, for not uh, challenging a, a caller who said that uh, uh, Indigenous Britons were set to become a minority by 2066 and, and was pushing this great replacement conspiracy theory. And now he's in favour of tearing down statues. I don't know if it was the sake of compensating. Now, despite all the fun in London and Scotland and everywhere else, there was actually something that happened in Westminster this week as well, something that largely affects the whole country. And that is that Boris finally announced the Great Unlocking, this, uh, this map of 119 days that we can march through to freedom. Now, we're not going to go into it in a huge amount of detail here. I mean, you'd have to be living under an absolute rock to not have seen the headline news. But one thing that we did pick up on the website was what, reveal, what was revealed to be the research underpinning this set of dates. And it's, it seemed to be about two and a half weeks out of date by the time that this stuff was announced. Because some of the assumptions, whether it's the number of vaccinations being given every single day, whether it's take up of the vaccines and whether it's the um, percentage by which the vaccines actually prevent transmission, a lot less was known about this when this unlockdown, down, um, unwinding plan was, uh, was written. And so one of the things that we've been looking into is just how much uh, more positive actually the vaccination stats seem to be. They seem to be much more effective than was assumed and the take up seems to be much higher than was assumed. One of the things that Boris Johnson was at pains to say on Monday evening was that we will be led through this by data, not dates. Where these dates aren't the sort of hard, in the sand um, lines. Uh, it's, it's actually going to be this five week review of the data each time. And yet, he was saying that in terms of saying these dates could go further back. What it looks to us, though, is that the data is all a lot more positive than the original assumptions. So surely, if we're looking at data, not dates, that must work both ways. That must mean that these dates can actually be brought forward as well as slip back. I mean, I don't think that, I don't think they will. The problem uh, for Boris going forward is he's got pretty much the whole sort of uh, political uh, Westminster establishment on side in terms of supporting the the current plan. What I worry about in terms of government comms is, uh, even though Boris has been very forceful in saying these dates are not hard, uh, you know, lines. Uh, the 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 dates of uh, unlocking the, the June the 21st, they have sort of really captured people's imagination because it gives them something to look forward to. And I think there'll be an incredible amount of uh, disappointment if for whatever reason they have to be delayed by even a week or two. Surely this gives, even if the data is a little bit out of date, it gives them a little leeway given we're over 100 days away from the end of this process. Uh, much can happen between then and now. So it might be that we will need extra days because something else has gone wrong mm. a new variant for mm. so i wouldn't i wouldn't um push it to revise right away one unlikely ally we've had on the guido Fawkes website this week has been professor lockdown himself professor neil ferguson who took to times radio on monday night to say that actually especially as we get closer to those end dates as we're talking about may and june the dates could actually be brought forward a little bit if the data is really positive because of course we're going to have between each stage of unlocking five weeks to assess the data and then give people warning to do the next stage of unlocking well is the data going to be really that different if it's if 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 all our information about the vaccines, the first stage, those first five weeks has been really positive and the next five weeks has been really positive, by what logic is the third uh, five week period of review of the data somehow going to be a disaster? Is the vaccine going to immediately become less effective at preventing infection or transmission? I, 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 I find that the, there isn't really much science to back that prospectus up at all. So it might be the case that we go down this sort of steady progress for the first few months. Um, and, but by the time we get to May, things could speed up, as Professor Ferguson said. It is right to be being cautious at this point to avoid having to reverse measures, which is even more economic, economically damaging than 
going at the fastest possible rate and then having to change course. And so I'm, I'm very supportive of the government's approach. I think I realise how difficult it is for that sector. And I would say if we're in the best case scenario where the vaccine effectiveness is even greater than current estimates would suggest, it really drives down transmission. There is always the potential, I think it's unlikely, but the potential of accelerating the rate of relaxation, particularly in the May-June timeframe. If Neil Ferguson has been an unlikely ally this week, then the Labour Party has been even more unlikely. Uh, They've won over many friends uh, on the right uh, and indeed were joined uh, this week uh, by David Cameron, who has also come out to warn Rishi Sunak against tax rises in the budget. Let's watch that clip. Let me answer directly on the issue of austerity. I mean, when I became Prime Minister in 2010, Britain was due to have the biggest budget deficit uh, anywhere in the world, not just the developed world, but the whole world. And I thought it was essential over time to get our finances in order. And I believe that that would contribute um, to our growth performance. And it did. I mean, by the time I left office, we were the fastest growing country in the G7. We had created millions of jobs, millions of new businesses have been set up. But today we do face very different circumstances. So piling, um, say, tax increases on top of that before you've even opened up the economy wouldn't make any sense at all. Two of the tax rises that have been floated have been um, capital gains tax and corporation tax, the latter of which the suggestions are that it will be raised from 19% to 25%, which is an enormous hike in corporation tax and a very peculiar one given one of the big lines of the coalition of the Cameron era was about how much more tax revenue they brought in by bringing down corporation tax. As corporation tax fell through the coalition years, the amount of money it took in rose because a lower corporation tax rate brings in more business, encourages more business, and actually ended up rising the revenue. So to completely throw away what was pretty um, standard Tory talking points seems to be a very peculiar thing to do, especially as we are emerging from this pandemic. Uh, In the last recession, we cut some taxes to try and recover. And yet now we're in this recession, it seems like Rishi Sunak is trying to look at hiking taxes, which would surely choke off any sort of recovery that's uh, coming down the line. That lower, lower corporation taxes brings in more revenue line wasn't just a Laffer curve Osborne era austerity thing. It was a it was a attack line in 2017. Tory headquarters was tweeting out lower corporation tax means higher revenues. So it's not new. We are in some kind of twilight world where the Taxpayers Alliance is retweeting Keir Starmer on corporation taxes, and the Tories are running against themselves from 2017. It's um it's a it's a weird, and I wonder if it's something to do with the fact that. You know, the whole new voter base for the Tories in the Red Wall isn't so concerned about corporation taxes. But I think what Rishi really has to bear in mind, if, if we think of him in his sort of in his politician hat rather than his uh, treasury hat, is uh, the Tories should never forgive him if he if he does this. If he comes out and undermines the argument that lower taxes can bring in higher revenue, those are going to be Labour attack lines for the next you know the next couple of elections uh and he will he will completely undermine a huge uh pillar of uh right-wing economic taxation thinking uh so it won't just be a short-term revenue disaster it'll be a long-term political uh bullet in the foot Absolutely. And I think that this whole thought that people in the red wall somehow um, think about corporation taxes less or that they'll feel the hit to their pocket less is, is so, so wrong. Because ultimately, when you tax corporations, what does that do? Where does the money come from? It comes from prices or it comes from wages or it comes from investment. It doesn't come from anywhere else. It's not magic money that can be just invented. Corporations are people. And so if you take money away from corporations, that means people get lower wages, there's less investment, or there are higher prices. You can't dart around that fact. And so if you want to do one thing to hit the people in this country who are struggling the most, it will be to take away a dynamic economy. It will to be to be uh, take away jobs or cut wages or raise prices. And raising corporation tax does any one of those three. The ideological problem, Tom, is that Rishi found 
John McDonald's magic money tree, hasn't he? But surely John McDonald's magic money tree right now says that borrowing is historically very low. We're not in the same position as we were in 2010 because every country in the world has borrowed. Borrowing is not historically low. Borrowing is so we don't immediately have to pay the cost of borrowing. Tom is low, not the borrowing. So if did I not say cost? I I apologise. I meant to say the cost of borrowing. So it's all very well until inflation goes up, and when we're seeing a global money printing. Uh, operation by central banks, the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, and always that has preceded inflation. And if inflation comes along, the cost of uh, all that borrowing will rise, and then we're in a lot of trouble. So, you know, the wise are saying maybe cheap money now isn't going to be forever. One of the things that's... But let's be be real about this. A corporation tax rise of 19 to 25% is not going to come near covering any of the borrowing that we've done over the last year. We're in a really deep hole when it comes to debt. No one is denying that. The question is, how do you pay it back? And by choking off a recovery before it's even begun seems to be an entirely counterproductive way to go about doing that. I agree with you. And so does David Cameron. And David Cameron was never on the radical right, free market, tax cutting wing of the party, was he? And if he's saying it, something is going very wrong. Switching gear completely from the economy to the media, uh, there was an interesting leak of an email that we received this week at Media Guido, which was from the head of home affairs at Sky News, telling everyone at Sky that the next person they hire we're going to be from the Bain community or a woman. So it's bad news for the chaps who might want to work at Sky. Um, obviously, we're going to see uh, Beth Rigby back very soon. And um, she's going to be putting up the quota of uh, female contributions to the on-air um, diversity, tick boxing. But it's, it's kind of unnerving. And the readers of uh, Guido Fawkes were particularly concerned that it plays into this woke diversity uh, uh, mantra that we're seeing from the BBC and increasingly Sky. Channel 4 have always been there and heralds a good uh, future for um, your future employers, Tom, doesn't it? Well, I just don't think that quotas are a particularly good way to solve problems of representation. I don't think they ever have been. And, and the, I, I don't think that viewers particularly um, appreciate it. I mean, sometimes you might want uh, more ethnically diverse people on on a particular show or something else and does that mean that you have to cut them back to meet some sort of arbitrary quota is there a ceiling as well as a floor how does this all work i don't think that you can solve diversity issues with maths um and i think that it is slightly worrying when you start to say no we can't hire you because we haven't filled up this particular quota or that particular quota um over over a particular year or program or month or whatever um i think there are better ways to do it the the thing with these sort of um media quotas or not just for media companies but but all sorts of companies is so often they're just directed at the very lowest level the really menial research entry level and actually when it comes to the bosses of these companies uh, increasing representation around the very top tier uh, it for some reason it stops i'm reminded of when we ran the story that news uk was getting woke and introducing diversity targets which funnily enough uh, sort of stopped just below the level of Rebecca Brooks. Uh, so actually, the very top <laughs> governance tier uh, remains, uh, you know, the decision making tier uh, remains uh, pretty undiverse. And actually, my perspective, and, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm sort of the token wet, is that very often when, when organisations like the BBC try being progressive and woke, it's, it's a really embarrassing sort of interpretation of what a load of you know, white male execs think is is what minority groups want. Whereas if you actually went and talked to BAME people uh, or LGBT people, uh, they're actually like, well, I don't really care about that. This is what I'm interested in. And unless they're at the top table making decisions, then it doesn't change anything. In fact, it's quite embarrassing and counterproductive. Also a bit patronising. If I thought I got a job just because I filled some uh, ticks and boxes, I'd be um, a bit... I'd have imposter syndrome. 
Well, the Conservative Party has had two female prime ministers and they have never had all female shortlists or any sort of positive discrimination like that. The Labour Party, which brought in all women shortlists to great fanfare in 1997, has not ever had a woman come ahead of a man in a leadership election. Not only has never had a, a female leader elected, but has never had a woman come even one space ahead of a man in a leadership election that goes out to the membership. Now, I think that probably says something about the culture of quote voters um, and and even if there are some really and there are some really talented um, people on uh, some really talented women on the labor benches but perhaps the membership think that oh did they get there because they're talented or did they get there because there's a quota and that undermines the people who genuinely are brilliant and deserve to be there I think that um, people like Emily Thornbury are brilliant at the dispatch box I absolutely love seeing her um, go at it disagree with everything she says but I think she's a fantastic performer and yet I, I wonder whether she's been sort of denigrated in the leadership processes over the years because people think oh why is she there is this just a ticker box uh, of course talking about patronizing employees of media organizations uh, we had a great story this week uh, it was following on from a Sun story that the BBC had offered their employees a, a seminar on how to drink water, how to stay hydrated. And so an FOI was promptly put in uh, and they uh, re uh, released the information that 30 employees of the BBC had voluntarily signed up to this hour long seminar uh, on how to drink water, uh, which I just found absolutely uh, hilarious. <laughs> Now, away from the London-centric world of the UK media, there was some media over in Germany that was saying some remarkably positive things about Britain. Uh, Bild is the most uh, read, the most widely read newspaper in Germany, and its front page on Wednesday morning had a big Union flag emblazoned across it saying, Britain, we envy you. And this was an enormous um, article, editorial, about the UK vaccination policy, which is getting on for vaccinating 30% of the people across the UK, whereas in Germany it's sitting around 5%. And just as Angela Merkel was talking about a third wave of the virus approaching Germany, was saying that restrictions will have to last for months and months longer, that they're not looking at a normal summer at all, they're looking across to Britain, which will likely be free of all restrictions by June, and thinking, wow, we're jealous of this Brexited place that didn't suffer under Ursula von der Leyen's three month late vaccine procurement. Um, that was quite a moment and it got widely shared in the UK media once we picked it up. I, this stuff comes from the top down, doesn't it? Because uh, on the Thursday, uh, Angela Merkel also did an interview in which she explained that because she was 66, she wouldn't be taking the AstraZeneca Oxford a vaccine because it is still German policy that for no reason, for no basis in science, that they claim the Oxford vaccine isn't safe for over 65s. And we've had Macron having to launch a, a, a sort of information propaganda campaign, whatever you want to say, uh, advertising the, the genuine effectiveness of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And, you know, we did question uh, why is it that French citizens may uh, be sceptical of the Oxford vaccine? Is it because uh, the French leadership, including Macron, spent weeks and weeks casting doubts and aspersions about its efficacy? And the tragedy here is that now, despite um, the EU arguing with AstraZeneca over, oh, you're not sending us enough vaccines, they actually have more AstraZeneca vaccines than they can give out despite the supply constraints, because people are refusing them, because of this fake news that was peddled by, I'm guessing, leaders in the EU who are jealous of Brexit Britain. The French vaccines failed, the Germans couldn't make a vaccine without help from the Americans, and yet Oxford has created a vaccine that real-world data from Scotland this week showed to be 94% uh, effective at reducing hospitalizations after the first dose. Now the AstraZeneca, um, now the Pfizer vaccine, by contrast, is only 80 84% effective at reducing hospitalizations after the first dose. If anything, a first dose's first strategy favors AstraZeneca, which seems to be more effective. And yet this fake news is still so pernicious within the EU that people are refusing the vaccine. It's extraordinary. Talking of fake medical news, readers uh, were very amused to learn uh, that Shadow Health Minister Dr. Uh, Alan Khan uh, this week tweeted a photograph purporting to be 
uh, UK health workers having to wrap themselves in bin bags due to a PPE shortage at the start of the pandemic. Just one problem, uh, it wasn't a photograph from this country, it was from Spain. So she slightly undermined her argument there uh, by proving that actually PPE shortages, uh, the whole of the Western world was in a mad scrabble and of course there were shortages uh, and, and everyone uh, was having to, to cope. Uh, we pointed out that uh, the Spanish government is in fact uh, run by Labour's socialist European uh, sister party. So it's quite uncomradely. Uh, we think readers particularly enjoyed it uh, because of uh, headline of the week. <laughs> no one expects the Spanish bin clinician. Well, on that note, that's it from us this week. Thank you so much for listening and or watching. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see different segments of the show linked with timestamps in the description if you want to skip to your favourite bit or skip back to your favourite bit. And remember, you can subscribe both on YouTube, click that notification bell to be reminded every Friday when a new episode comes out, but also wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, we are everywhere. So thank you once again for watching and we'll see you next week.